the panelists today uh, are focusing on the intersection of new media and political engagement. And all of them are some combination, we'll see how they would describe themselves, as uh, entrepreneurs, which is, again, why we're co-hosting this, journalists and communication experts. And I'm just going to lightly introduce each of them. And I think we've, you'll weave in comments about them, and you'll weave in comments about yourselves. So starting from right here, Jenny Bacchus, class of 90, is the president of Bacchus Consulting, LLC, uh, a strategic communications firm. At least I hope that's that an accurate way of describing accurate. it. Yep. Uh, Jenny has served in leadership positions for uh, Fortune 500 companies and throughout the political arena. She has managed more than 40 presidential primary debates, uh, a skill set which is increasingly relevant as we enter <laughs> a new season. Uh, recently, Jenny served for three years as a senior policy advisor and head of strategic partnerships and engagement for Google. John Klein, who I met what seems like ages ago, but uh, only within the last couple years, is now becoming a close friend and even more important, a close friend of the Nelson Center, uh, is the president, and I had to check the pronunciation, of V-Links, of V-Links, V-Links. Uh, VLINX, an artificial intelligence platform that enables media companies to understand their content and how it is used better than ever before. John is the co-founder and co-chairman of Tap Media, a subscription video platform for personalities with superfan followings that is backed by Discovery Communications and Google's Eric Schmidt. Uh, John served as the president <laughs> of CNN US from 2004 to 2010, reviving the then struggling brand by integrating technology to support a renewed commitment to in-depth journalism. CNN then attained record ratings under John's leadership, doubling profits while winning the most awards in its history. Ellen McGirt, class of 84, is a senior editor at Fortune, where she writes Race Ahead, <laughs> an award-winning daily column on race, culture, and inclusion in corporate life and beyond. In the past, Ellen has worked for Time, Money, and most recently Fast Company, where she wrote or contributed to more than 20 cover stories and created the digital series, The 32nd MBA. I spent two years getting my MBA, so <laughs> it may have been more fruitful for me to read Ellen's work. Uh, her reporting has taken her inside the C-suites of Facebook, Nike, Twitter, Intel, Xerox, and Cisco, on the campaign trail with Barack Obama and across Africa with Bono to study breakthrough Ooh. philanthropy. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was hoping I'd get one. <laughs> Jenny Kaplan, class of 2014, is the co-founder and CEO of Wonder Media Network, along with Shira Atkins, who's in the back there. And I, I say this with enormous pride because both Shira and Jenny were my students in my entrepreneurial process course. In fact, Jenny uh, became my teaching assistant for two semesters uh, in which Shira took that course. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Jenny has told me, although with um, too much credit, that she caught the entrepreneurial bug in my course uh, although all the credit for what Shira and Jenny are doing uh, belongs to them. Uh, two days ago, I had lunch with somebody who asked me, why 13 years ago did I come back to Brown to start to teach entrepreneurship, and why am I now leading the Center for Entrepreneurship? And you don't have to look any further than to Jenny and Shira to answer that <laughs> question. I'm enormously proud of them and all my students, and I'm so happy that uh, Jenny has come back to be on this panel. So I'm going to turn this over to Ed Steinfeld, the director of the Watson Institute. Please join me in welcoming Ed and all four of our panelists. Thank you. Good morning. And I especially want to welcome you all to uh, the Watson Institute's new building, Stephen Robert Hall. Uh, uh, please be frequent. I, I was going to say visitors or guests. You're all part of the community. Please be frequent presences here uh, through the weekend, but next year and at any time. Uh, 
And I just also say, I'm so thrilled that this event is being co-hosted by the Nelson Center and Watson. Uh, that's typical of what we do at Brown. We collaborate. I'll just speak for the Watson Institute. Our future depends on our ability to keep engaging the most vital parts of Brown, all of Brown, and especially the Nelson Center. So we have um, a typically extraordinary panel of, of, of Brown alums. Let me just start with the first question that I, I'd like each of you to answer, you know, maybe briefly. Um, we're bombarded with all different kinds of information, all different kinds of media today, and you all have played a role in generating media and curating it. And so there's so much distrust today, so much concern that there's no truth, that there's fake news. And where do you find truth in the media? How do you find truth in the media? Jenny, That's a problem. That? I, I stuck first. No. Um, that is actually, um, I think, probably the biggest question that is facing society. I mean, it's a really tough and hard question, but it's a great question. Okay, there's a, I think that, I mean, I took semiotics at Brown, which I don't know if anybody did back in the day. Modern culture and media, it changed its name. And, and they taught you nothing, mean, uh, the, people walked out of there saying nothing means anything. A tree is a dog is a, um, <laughs> it was, you know, you walked out of there and, and like there were some people like, yes, yes. And then the rest of us were like, what? Um, but, um, but I think where you find truth is it's all about, I think it is all about curation right now. Um, you you have to find, and I also think it's about referees. People are looking for people to call the balls and strikes right now. You 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 have the Fox News, you have the news coming over here. I you know I've grown up reading the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal, so I think that's where the truth is. And I know a lot of journalists that are that are there. But I think we do. There's so much out there now because of how technology has changed it. There are so many people that are 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 saying that they're the voice that I think that what we are looking for, or, or the way to find truth, is to find people who are sort of factually cutting things down and places where you can go. Like, it's almost like we need a modern day encyclopedia, that you can go to a place where you can look something up um, and, and, and you can sort of weigh it with the lenses that are around it. Now, what's also happened, and I'm looking at Jenny down at the end, is and, El and some of Ellen's writing, which is amazing, is there are lenses that these people that you think are truth to, are, are putting around things. Like I, as a woman watching presidential coverage in this election cycle, you see Howard Schultz, sorry, old CNN, get a town hall. Yet you see <laughs> um, Kamala Harris or Elizabeth Warren put out policy after policy that they can't break through. And that is, quote unquote, neutral people who probably think they're neutral, but are finding it more interesting to have a corporate CEO get a town hall than someone who's talking about childcare. So, there are, one of the things that happened, I think, is that that you, we are starting to realize that people that really see themselves as truth tellers don't maybe realize that they have biases that are that are influencing the way that they're telling their truth. So I think that's, that's a big challenge that's coming up. And then you're going to need to have more people kind of challenging that orthodoxy without, with also understanding that people are really trying to give a rounded picture. Um, and, and you don't, and so a lot of people are sort of professing their biases before they report the news. That's a, that gets a little hard too, but I, I think that's that's kind of what you're seeing in the media right now. At least that's what I'm feeling. John? So um, thanks to Ed, I got to lead a study group this past semester at Watson. Uh, thanks to you, the Watson Institute and our students were the beneficiaries <laughs> of your study. Well, it, it was really, you said yes to the idea, and, it, and it, it was called the news versus the truth. I have one of our, our participants right here. Um, and I, I, I learned um, some really significant things because I, the co-leader of the session uh, was a Brown psychology professor named Steve Sloman, uh, who's written a book called The Knowledge Illusion, in which he makes the point, and we explored this at length in the study group, that we each define truth differently. We tend, or I should say, we form our beliefs based on what people who we trust tell us. And so there's truth, which is, you could boil that down to you know, facts, you know, gravity is the truth, even though it's a scientific theory, it's, it's true. You know, certain things are just true, but a lot of the contentiousness that we feel and the shifting ground we feel, um, I'd argue has to do more with um, how people are applying 
those facts, the conclusions that they're drawing from facts. Um, you know, everybody in the abortion debate right now may agree on all the facts about when a heartbeat, it, you know, is discernible and, you know, how mitosis and meiosis occur and all of that, but they disagree on the outcome. And that has nothing to do with a disagreement about basic facts. That's belief systems. If anybody went to synagogue this morning or is going to church tomorrow, um, that's not, you, you, you might take issue with the, you know, with the truth, uh, the factualness of some of the stories underlying the Bible, but you're still going to church or to temple. And, and I think that's at the core of what, so um, sources of truth are going to depend on what circles you're in, separate from facts, which um, I think depends on the audience, the, the receivers, the consumers of information, having a, a, a better understanding of, of how, to, how to parse what they're hearing. So news literacy, information literacy, I think becomes very important. So to build on all of that, I'll, I'll start by going back in time to one of the first stories I wrote when I was at Fast Company, and it was the first ever profile of a young tech executive named Mark Zuckerberg, which at the time, um, until very recently, was something I was um, very excited to tell people about. <laughs> we put him on the cover. There was only, they only had six million users, and they were still so new out of the old college-only system that um, I, didn't ha I wouldn't have a Facebook account. And um, I think I was the first person from the class of 84 outside of anybody who was in academics to have a Facebook account. It was the only time I've ever been a trailblazer of any kind. Um, so six million users, and Mark and his entire executive staff were my first Facebook friends. To, so as part of teaching me how it worked and to understand the potential power of this platform that they were still trying to figure out themselves. And the extraordinary thing about it, and I knew enough about the world, and I certainly knew enough about people to know this was nonsense, but they, they were building the entire um, energy and momentum of the site on people sharing information about themselves and calling that news. And that was going, and that was going, the news feed was still brand new, and his, his, his proud use case for why it was so important was, People were complaining about newsfeed on newsfeed, and it was generating news about newsfeed, and it was this whole big thing. <laughs> I said, and see, it works. And sure enough, here we are many, many years later, it, it's working. So to build on trust and bias, what, ended up, what ends up happening is that people take their status and their role as communicators in their communities, however they define that digitally in their lives, and they begin to broadcast things that make them feel good. And I wish I could believe that presenting them with a set of facts, even as basic as, gravi as gravity, would be helpful. But what, <laughs> but what we're, matter. it doesn't matter. What we're seeing overwhelmingly is, um, at, at least from my point of view, as someone who writes a daily column about race, every day, <laughs> you know, I'm like, did Liam Neeson say something terrible? Are we talking about Robert E. Lee again? Who got shot? I mean, it is just the most grim look at, a, at the American psyche that you could possibly imagine. And yet people want to really engage in this because it's the hard work of confronting their biases. It's the hard work of understanding a history that has never been surfaced. So between truth and in media, it's like a history major. This is the history major's answer. We have to understand everything about our origin. We have to understand how our communities are founded and why certain people never get a mortgage even though they're credit worthy and why people gravitate to certain types of news and information and then share it. And the, the truly, truly dangerous thing about Facebook is that I don't even get to see the news that you see and then it just disappears and nobody's held accountable. So those are the kinds of difficult issues that we're asking voters to, um, and readers and subscribers to talk about and, and parse when they really wanna talk about you know, same-sex marriage or they wanna talk about you know, limiting civil rights or people who consider themselves part of a faith-based community saying terrible things about refugees at our border. You know, there's just no common ground right now. So um, for me, ultimately, and I, to, I want to end um, this, my little sad little speech here on the idea of trust, because it's something that we're really grappling with, is that um, how do you develop trust? How do you develop a brand that's trusted? How do you develop a voice as a curator that people will follow and believe? 
and will pay for ultimately because that's what the media has to do. We have to solve the problem of getting people to pay for the reporting that's truthful. Um, is that the, the Edelman Trust Barometer this year, it's, a, it's an annual survey of the institutions in our world, around the world, that people trust. And for the first time, um, NGOs rank second to not just business, but my employer. I, I trust my employer to understand the news I under, and, to under, and to be truthful with me and to weigh in on issues that matter to me. I trust N NGOs next, and I trust business in general, and then last, um, last comes media, and in between there is government somewhere. It's always sort of a shifting lower right fight now. to the bottom, <laughs> media and, and government. But the idea that people trust their employers is taking real, it's taking real root here. A, um, and we're asking employers to weigh in. There's, there, every day there's another um, amicus brief or you know, collect letter and they're worried about um, transgender rights and access to bathrooms and same-sex marriage. And they're really moving on these issues because the, um, their employees want them to. So it is a, it's a strange new development. And the cynical answer is I trust people who pay me, who are smart enough to pay me, <laughs> because I can, that is the one sign of their good judgment. But actually, <laughs> but with the, I think Howard Schultz has sort of found out a little bit, but for the, with, with some exceptions, we've seen some extraordinary leadership. Wow, it's hard to go last here. Um, I think thinking about truth, building on what all of you said, um, really right now, there's an opportunity more than ever, there are information from more and more sources. And it isn't that when people were getting news from a few places, there wasn't bias. There were clearly biases forever. There were, have always been people writing the news. And so I think that the more information there is, there's actually also an opportunity to address who's writing it. I think more and more, um, as Jenny mentioned, it's people are bringing out to begin with who they are and what their biases are when they're writing. <clears throat> excuse me, when they're writing the news, when they're reporting, when you see on Twitter, if people are using that as a source of news, you can go to their bios and see who they are and where they're coming from. And I think that that's a challenge to curate and figure out what is real, what is true, what are facts, if facts even are the same for different people. But also it's an opportunity to be able to hear from people who are using their own voices to tell their own stories. Mm -hmm. And I think there's power in that. Um, I think there are all sorts of new and old mediums. I have a podcast company, so I'm particularly fond of that medium. But I think part of the power of that is that you're hearing people tell their own stories with their own voices. And at some point, it's really a literacy issue. How are we going to figure out how we identify what's true and what's not to us? So on Facebook, if you're looking through your news feed and it looks like it's from a reputable source, that's great. But how do we actually know that that's true? Um, and to me, that comes back to that curation factor. Who are the people I trust? What are the institutions that I do still trust? My, before I started this company, I worked at Bloomberg News as a reporter, so I have a lot of respect for traditional or not so traditional media. Um, and I think that it's important, and there are things about fact checking, and these big institutions are big institutions for a reason. But I think it comes back to, I actually think it's a good thing that we're questioning now what is true, where is this news coming from, how do we take those facts like gravity, look at the lenses that those facts are being reported through, and identify what we think is correct. Because there isn't really one truth. There are all these different truths depending on where you're sitting. So that's not a very easy answer. But I think that it's sort of like we have to have the responsibility to take on that education to try to figure out what is accurate and what isn't and how we move forward with that sort of lack of clarity. Sure. We're going to just do maybe two more questions and then we'll open it up to the audience. So please uh, generate some questions. But for this one, maybe uh, anybody can weigh in, but maybe this one will focus on Jenny Bacchus and John Klein. Uh, so the, two, the 2020 presidential campaign, I was about to say is about to begin, but it, it's, it's, we're well into it <laughs> in a big way. Jenny, as a person who's sh trying to shape a message for clients, and John, as somebody who's, from a, for a big organization, tried to um, develop strategies for delivering the message, what do you think are going to be, what's going to be the critical platform 
on which discussion happens like in this wild media space. Well, the interesting thing that I've learned like now maybe through four presidential campaigns and watching media cover presidential campaigns and trying to impact it is that there's a huge tendency to try to run the last race and not this race. So, and, and candidates that have, um, you know, uh, we started off before Barack Obama even got onto the scene with Hillary and McCain, and McCain was trying very hard not to be Bush, and Hillary was trying very hard not to be John Kerry. And Barack Obama was just doing his own thing over here. And I think that is something that, you know, at, or I've watched, John like came, I got to work actually with John on presidential debates um, when he was running CNN. And CNN did something really innovative. They decided that people would wanna listen to presidential primary debates, which like in DC was like, what? Why would you ever go to California <laughs> Democratic Convention and all those crazy people and, and hear them talk? Um, it really changed who you saw in, and I worked in the 04 cycle, the 08 cycle, and then sort of, I was at Google in 12, sort of watching from, from outside. But then we kind of, now we have millions of debates. So that model that CNN built, they're still trying to have a presidential debate. How are you gonna have a presidential debate with 36 people on the stage, or even 12? Those debates are not gonna serve the same role anymore. Um, so I think it's hard to, sort. you can say, oh, this is gonna be the Twitter or the Snapchat, or I think it's gonna be, the, I think it's actually, the technology that's gonna be the most uh, powerful is gonna be the one that's actually helping people actually talk to real people in these states because there's so many candidates. You can't win with a huge TV buy right now. You, uh, you're gonna have to go and find 6,000 people in, in Ames, Iowa to like go out in the middle of the snow in February and caucus for you. You're gonna have to, so, but I think it's, what is happening is media is changing how candidates are running. So. In order to get news, Elizabeth Warren goes to Georgia, or Beto goes gets his haircut. Now uh, there was a great um, there was a great Karen Tomlety column in D.C., which is like shared by all my friends about like what would have happened if Amy Klobuchar went to get her haircut, or right, like right. that would have been a whole di to go back to your bias question. Um, so I think that's going to be really interesting. I guess to add these two things and then turn it over to John because I'll give you a nice hard question here, but. <laughs> The last two days, I have been so troubled by what has happened with this Nancy Pelosi video. Um, and I think it is getting to the core of what the biggest challenge, because first of all, there are foreign actors that are deliberately using our social media platforms and are some of our own problems. I mean, they're, <laughs> we're helping them, but um, to, to shape this election. and and. That video of Nancy Pelosi, the president of the United States retweeted, and Fox is talking about like it's a fact. And it's Facebook won't take it down. Right, face, that's the thing. And Twitter, like all these people on Twitter are like, Jack, are you gonna take the video down? Jack, are you gonna take away? So that was a big test for me, whether or not the old sort of system of ethics and values. I mean, I've been sort of, I'm a Democrat, so I've been constantly disappointed. I have lots of Republican friends. I have been, what, why haven't they said anything about Trump? Like, it, it just, it's crazy. Like, the ones I used, to, Bob Dole and all these people I first met, like, what happened to them? Now it's the same thing with the media. I was like, okay, well, they learned their lesson from last cycle. They won't let this happen again, and they're not. So I don't know. I'm a little bit, so that's a good example of, I, it's going to be the technology tool. I think the way it is, it's, it's on accountability. That it's going to be mass accountability that actually ends up forcing people to change their behavior. If Lindsey Graham has everybody in South Carolina say, you can't do that. Or if, if people go at Zuckerberg and say, we're gonna boycott all your corporate advertisers, we're not gonna, we're gonna take, we're gonna take away your accounts, we're not gonna give you clicks on eyeballs, that it's gonna be actually technology that enables collective action to actually hold people accountable for bad behavior. I think that's, that's gonna be the sort of way, that's like my thought. Sorry to give you the Nancy Pelosi video, but there you go. <laughs> Um, you know, in terms of in terms of what's influential, um, filterless platforms, the, the the more direct connection there is between a candidate and and the voters, uh, I think the more influential um, these town halls that 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 the networks have started to do, I think, are phenomenal for that because the candidates actually get to speak at length about what they would do, and it's not you know built in fireworks or you know, fights or anything like that. And we, we worked hard at CNN um, in, in the 2007, 2008 debate cycle to, uh, I, I, was, I was really surprised when I got to CNN, the, the producers of the debates um, 
not you in particular, but the, 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 the commonly held belief was that our job was to get them to fight with each other. Right. And I had to say, whoa, wait a minute. Like, I had been out of the news business for six years. I had been at CBS News for a long time. I'd overseen 60 Minutes. I'd skip, but then I left, and I, and I had a startup for six years. And I come back, and I see this, and I said, well, no, I, you know, as, a, as an audience member, I actually want to hear them say what they'll do if they're president. So let's get rid of the fighting. And we tried an experiment. I think it was South Carolina debate. There it go. Was three of them, right? There yeah. was Hillary... Obama and John Edwards, Edwards still, yeah. right? We did it in two parts. We had the uh, classic kind of debate structure. They're standing at podiums and they're, you know, we're, we're firing questions mm -hmm. at them. And then for the second half, we had them come down off the podiums, yeah. remember, and yep. sit in those comfy yeah. chairs and just have a conversation. And they got to speak at length and we got to hear them. And the second half was you saw a spike in the ratings for that, which should have cured once and for all this idea that the classic debate structure is the way to go and people want to hear. In fact, clearly you had empirical evidence that the audience really does want to hear more from them. So now you're seeing in, in the town halls, you get the chance to do that. And then of course, it still gets back to what Professor Steve Sloman taught me, which is what your friends tell you about what they're hearing and seeing. So, you know, you, it, it, I think it's very powerful if you can hear Amy Klobuchar or Elizabeth Warren speak at length, it gets rid of all power of media outlets to spin it, right, in those first few moments. And then of course it gets, you know, thrown into the, into the, the rinse cycle and, and, you know, everybody else gets to <laughs> define it and suddenly, other, you know, people start coming away saying, well, actually, yeah, what she, you know, she was terrible. I thought she had been great, but now I, I realize how terrible she was. But, you know, for those brief shining moments, you, you get a, you know, get a direct connection. But then I think a lot depends on what your friends say about it. You know, I'm leaning more toward this because I like her ideas about blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, she's got more ideas than I thought she'd have. That's surprising. That's good. And that's sort of how people start to make up their minds. Just a quick anecdote on that. So my job after, so Gore, quote unquote, lost his first debate, the size and lies debate. Like he lost the spin on expectations. So my job in the carry cycle, Michael Hooley said, you have um, $500,000 to buy online advertising to say Gore won, I mean, to say Kerry won, whether or not he did. So that's what, that's, that's exactly what you're talking about. Do you remember, <laughs> we, we got rid of a thing where oh, there, there was a, there was a thing post-debate, there, there would be the spin room yeah. um, where, you know, journalists would wait and all the candidates would file in and we would rush to stick our mics in their face and they would tell us yeah. how well they did, yeah. right? And, and we got rid of the spin room because it's like, why, why would we, as a news organization, willingly put ourselves in position to be spun? <laughs> you just heard them talk. Make up your own mind. But all of that stuff is very controversial, and it's not the conventional approach that's taken. So I think part of the issue is the way that establishment media had fallen into this, this sort of hand-in-hand -hand collusion with all, the entire political establishment as to how a campaign is covered and talked about. And a little bit of the distrust you were speaking of, I think, is earned. You know, has been earned. I, my, my career in media spans, I think, a, like a, 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 an increase in sensationalism uh, in news and a decline in, you know, kind of rigorous or classical, you know, news values of, you know, sobriety and, and, and just present the information. Um, and, and lo and behold, we're down at the bottom of the trust pile. Well, you know, let's start fixing that to the degree that we can win back people's trust. I think that's important. For this, this last question, I want to turn to Ellen and, and Jenny. Kaplan, um, I catch myself not infrequently now thinking, well, I can't just have a Cronkite. <laughs> I can just turn on the TV, turn the channel to Walter, or, you know, grab the New York Times and just get the get the honest truth. And I, um, <laughs> in my few more self-reflective moments, I think, you know, maybe that's just nostalgia for something that never really was. And those establishment channels themselves excluded lots of voices, whether intentionally or not, and were, and reflected power. And so what I want to ask you both is, uh, to what extent is that true? And have we gotten beyond that in any, in any positive way? Okay, I'll start. <laughs> well, first of all, you can still pick up a New York Times. 
<laughs> people may have forgotten. But um, I think that, I think it's both. I mean, I do think that the news, as both of you were just referencing, has become significantly more sensationalized. And I think some of it comes down to the fact that it's a media business. And I know that when I was at Bloomberg during the 2016 election cycle, stories that had Trump in the headline did better. Like they got more clicks, people wanted to read them more. And depending on where you are, that, I mean, that's what you want. You want your stories to get read. And so I think that there is definitely, there has been a sensa sensa news has become more sensationalized. On the other hand, I do think that there have always been issues with power and truth and all of these different biases in news. And I do think that as many of us learned here at Brown, it's about finding different sources and figuring out it isn't just turning on Walter Cronkite or just reading the New York Times. It's how can we use different sources to try to not just be within an echo chamber to read the same things over and over again. How can we try to sort of deepen our understanding of the stories at hand? And I think that is through different kinds of mediums, whether it's social media or podcasts or just different kinds of newspapers, whatever it is, taking a minute to think like, okay, I can read the New York Times and watch a YouTube channel and listen to podcasts and all of these different ways to actually get different perspectives instead of just going to that one source. And I think that's more powerful than just turning on one TV channel and accepting it as fact. I think part of the, the, the implicit thing I have in the back of my mind is that for all of the multiplication of media channels, maybe they're just accentuating misogyny, accentuating bias, ethnic biases, rather than, I'm worried that, that those aren't washing out. Yeah, I, I would just quickly would say I agree. I mean, I also think that increasingly we're only reading the news that appeals to us. So my news may be more addressing uh, things that I care about. And so misogyny is being addressed head on in what I'm reading, but that's because that's what I'm interested in and it's what's targeted towards me on Facebook or Twitter and everything that I read is that way. But that's for sure my own echo chamber. And it may be that yours is very different. And so you're not getting that news. And I agree with you that there's a risk. The question is, how can we, a lot of this, it seems like a lot of what we've talked about throughout this panel is how can we, as a community of citizens or people in the world, um, change that and, and get out of our echo chambers and try to overcome and maybe use technology in a different way to instead see more opinions instead of fewer opinions. Yeah, you really, you really hit to the the crux of the matter here. Is that what is, what is the, um, what will compel people to step out of their normal media consumption to find a reliable voice that may be different from them? Because everything about that voice is going to feel so foreign that it's going to feel unreliable. And um, and I was really struck just listening to our CNNers here. I mean, I wish we had more time to just ask you a million questions about what it was like back in the day, because I have never been a political reporter. But every now in my then in my life, I've been sort of I dipped into that world, and I went into a spin room once. I was following the it was in New Hampshire, and I was following it was 2004, um, all the Democratic candidates, and it is when you're used to it. It seems like a perfectly normal thing, and when you're not, you think, "This is how it happens here." No, no wonder we're a mess. And I, I walk into the spin room, New, University of New Hampshire. They clearly hated journalists. The only snack was a huge bowl like this filled with prunes. <laughs> I got the joke. I got the joke. And then when I got into the spin room, it was filled with political operatives and the candidates and their candidate surrogates and media. Everyone assumes I was with the Sharpton campaign. Oh my goodness. It was the most amazing. I walk in, you know, I've got a pad, and then suddenly every camera's on me, you know, just <laughs> waiting for me to say something about what Al Sharpton had just said on stage. <laughs> and that is to my other point about trust, the talent pipeline in every aspect, from technology to media to reporting to um, branding and all of it is so thin, and we just keep um, identifying as talented and promoting the exact same person. And this is 2004, right? So the ability to find an alternative, uh, another voice is going to feel so jarring for anybody who remembers, even with some fondness, the, 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 great, the three great men 
of, of television news. So um, anything that we can do and anything we can do together or anything I can do to be in service to this, to make sure that we're pointing to people who are um, creating a body of work that is um, quality and that's serious and that we can underwrite them and we can subscribe to our local papers and we can listen to important podcasts, you know, all of these things. It's as important as, you know, eating right and exercising every day is exercising our right to support the media that will make the world better, not worse. Great. Questions from the audience. There actually, there are microphones here, so if you can just move to the microphone. And we'll start taking questions. And please be brief, and the panelists also will be brief. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Thank you so much for sharing all of your opinions. I think it was fascinating to get all of the different perspectives. So I wanted to jump off of one of Jenny's earlier points, which was the idea that media companies are essentially businesses. Even social media companies are businesses. And there are a lot of intrinsic factors and money, a lot of it coming from advertisers. And there's an intrinsic motivation, in my opinion, to show people content that will kind of, you know, uh, exacerbate their emotions and, you know, get them going. So even with, you know, things like what John is working on, artificial intelligence and options that might help alleviate it and just distill it down to facts, are those even viable solutions or is there a viable solution to this problem with all of this money coming in the system and an intrinsic motivation for social media companies and media companies to display information that kind of panders to human psychology to some extent? Well, I would just say that um, one of the best things that has happened in the last, under the Trump administration has been more people are paying for media, like the rise of subscriptions to newspapers. More funding into sort of the old truth tellers or the gatherers is going to give them more money to get out onto those platforms and kind of fight back because it, it is a, it's actually an interesting policy question that's happening right now in Washington of is Facebook a news, news gathering organization or are they a media platform under one way they're regulated they don't want to be seen as a news because it's a different set of rules so there's a lot of fighting about like how do we define these guys but more funding into truth tellers both in the traditional media and then sort of outside documentary films yep. podcasts. The, media, the New York Times' podcast is like one of the most well-listened to podcasts out there, and they, they're still telling the sort of the same truths that they were reporting, but they're now using their increased subscription dollars to, to fight in that realm. So I think that is maybe one way. People do need to make money. You need to pay journalists. Journalists like teachers and nurses are woefully underpaid. Um, uh, but it's a financial business. Um, you need to be able to fight back, but I do think that's how you're going to do that's how you're going to fight it is is when other people learn how to manipulate those social media platforms just like the russians then we will win so <laughs> i'd also question the premise that conflict creates audience um yeah. at, at cnn we eliminated as much as we could the conflict and we had the highest ratings we've ever had including today during the trump bump so people the more noise there is in the system the more people crave analysis and understanding the most dvr show on the CNN schedule is Fareed Zakaria, GPS, yeah. which is con a conflict-free zone. It's all analysis, and people can't miss it. it, it and so I, I, I think it's important for media people to grasp that. The most popular podcast, you don't, you're not building your podcast based on conflict, let's get people to fight. It's let's open your mind and let's have intriguing conversations, right? Right. What we're actively trying to do is our mission is that we're trying to amplify underrepresented voices. And so our mission is based on the idea that what people actually want, what draws people in is good storytelling. And that doesn't have to mean fighting. In fact, I think a fight becomes quite boring, especially right now. People are used to that divisive debate fight going at each other and don't trust it anymore and don't want to hear more of that. So I think some of it may come down to exactly what you're referring to, which is that that isn't actually what people want. Um, but I think there is momentum that has to be shifted a little bit when you think about what big media companies think gets ratings because they think that the conflict gets ratings the question is can new kinds of media can startups shift that and show and can consumers show that actually what they want is a deeper understanding i think that's actually part of the reason that podcasts as an industry have blossomed <laughs> so much because 
at the same time as many kinds of medias are, media is getting shorter and shorter and more and more bullet points and all these different things, podcasts instead are more and more in-depth stories that can be definitely conflict-free zones, yeah. but and, it's really like a full narrative. Yeah, and look at, I, I don't know you want to get to the next question, but just yeah. one final, <laughs> like NPR is a conflict-free zone and yeah. it's PBS. got 25 to 30 million weekly listeners. It, it rivals, if they, if they were ad supported, they'd be making a lot of money. So, you know, it, it's, there's proof everywhere. I think it's lazy executives. It's just easier to promote a fight because no one's going to fire you for doing that. Like everyone does that, so I'm just going to do that. It's it, it, what I hope is that data is going to open our eyes to what actually works, and I think what actually works is more information. As, as you, thanks so much. My name is Dewey Weigott. I'm a graduate of Brown and also the late great WBRU News. Hey, Woo! Uh, okay. uh, I have first. I have a brief observation based on what all of you are saying. In most digital platforms the user is encouraged to search out what he or she wants, and that automatically excludes everything else. In the analog platforms, the, the Walter Cronkite world of old, there may still have been biases, but the viewers were exposed um, most likely to viewpoints they weren't necessarily just searching out on their own. So I have a question. Uh, how do we strike a balance in the new media world so that uh, the average user is exposed to more than just what occurs to them. I mean, like the answer to that is social media. Yeah, yeah, I, like that is. So I, I, um, I want to build on um, what you were saying about conflict-free zones because I think it is so important um, to be able to speak to people as human beings and 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 just to create a product that's welcoming for, for folks. Jessica Yellen, who's a journalist I care very much about and I admire her, was recently at one of our conferences, and she talked about the coaching that she received when she first started to cover politics, and she was told to watch ESPN because you know, that debate where you know, a bunch of men sit around and fight about the, the game they just watched is, was the model, and, you know, which, is, which is not welcoming to anybody but a certain type of 18 to 34-year-old man who is very valuable to advertisers. And that's what the entire model is built around. And the rest of the media is, uh, temporary entertainment media is built around attracting a 14 to 16 year old girl. So just let that wash over you. <laughs> so if you think about the human beings, if, you are, if you're looking for media or designing media or you're amplifying media and sharing it with your friends, something that's welcoming to somebody who's not just um, a, a teenage girl who's gonna buy um, makeup and tickets or a guy who wants to fight about the game, um, then suddenly you've got something that you can share you can share, and you can converse with people about, and then it becomes a, a welcoming thing. But it's going to be the design, and you're, you're absolutely right about it. And you are right about it, too. <laughs> right, WBRU News is not late. It's, it's alive and well and doing a lot of podcasting, in fact. Yeah, all right. uh, my name is Kurt Spaulding. I'm with the IBIS, the Institute for Environment Society here at Brown. Quick question. For the first time, I think, in 2020, we're going to see climate change become an issue somewhere aligned in the top five conversation. And the media hasn't done a wonderful job, I think. I think there's this watching Chuck Todd try to change things in January. And of course, our good friend Anderson Cooper got criticized for questioning whether climate, you know, the idea is climate change is gravity. It's not to be debated. So how do you think they're going to do with this? I just read Jay Inslee's 22-page statement on climate change, and I could only understand four pages of it. It's so thick and hard, and I know something about it. I was the regional administrator of EPA for Obama. So um, how do you think they're going to do with this? And I, know, and I want to say great for CNN because Ted Turner, I, I think his spirit around climate issues has always been with CNN, and Ted Turner being a Brown alumni, it's very important to speak to that. You know, I... Another thing I learned in our study group is too much information really overloads people. The reason that people rely on their friends to tell them what to think is because there's just way too much information out there, and there's more than ever, as, as we've established. So um, you, you, you do need to boil things down, but you don't have to dumbify them. Um, and and you, it's, it's, it isn't so much having to drill certain you know, facts pounded into people's heads over and over again. 
there is something to to be said for making a you know just a a, a vividly powerful uh, illustration of one piece of information or another, um, you know. But 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 people, you know, and I'm a big. Like, I sent Anderson around the world. We did a series called Planet in Peril uh, to try and get at it in that way to tell the stories of people who were affected by climate change and and what it meant. You know, one image of a polar bear, you know, stranded on an ice floe can do more to sensitize people to, you know, the realities uh, than anything. But I do suspect, and you probably know this better than anyone, as people's beach homes start to float away, or as, you know, you go to Miami and, and, and you're driving along a street in Miami and suddenly it's flooded in, in the middle of the street, it's going to start affecting people more profoundly. We saw it Midwest floods this, you know, this, this uh, past spring. Um, I think it'll become easier for journalists to actually access those stories and, and illustrate them. Just to quickly add to that, I also think that um, there's a huge corporate understanding now of climate change. And I, I hate to sit, I mean, I remember taking <laughs> Ross Chait's class in Earth and Other Ethics. Like, it, it actually, but corporations are actually taking a moral position on this. And when you have corporations pushing up here who advertise, and then you have like my niece who just graduated from UT Austin, who like I can't have any cup in my house because it violates some some, and I always recycle wrong, and I need I just get really stressed <laughs> about it. Like, but then and then you have like the New York Times. It just like literally has been pouring dollars if you've been reading them yes. into like the planet and what's been happening. I think you're gonna just organically see it this time. The the town hall voters are gonna ask the questions. The media corporate sponsors who are sponsoring and underwriting all this stuff are going to ask the questions. I think you'll, yeah, I, I think it's really flipped. It's almost like gay rights in some senses. Like it's now just become a, an accepted thing, which is really good. Media is not good at leading a, a discussion. It's better at following what, you know, they are all trying to hit that bullseye of what you care about right now, as opposed to here's what you should care about. They're not as efficient at that. I also think that like, gay rights, as you mentioned, it's sort of a generational thing as well. I think that the beach homes is a great example um, for an older cohort. And I think that from what I'm seeing and hearing, young, the younger generation, the people who are just starting to be able to vote, climate change is like their biggest issue. Yeah. It's their top issue. And even though the challenge is that young people don't tend to vote, which is a bigger problem. But <laughs> I think that as those people get older, it too will become more and more prevalent, but it's hard to tell how candidates will do with it until they have to actually answer the question. But it will clearly be a top thing this go round. Hey, uh, so thank you. Um, John, just a quick comment. Um, your comments on the town hall format and that lengthy discussion really echo, I think, what Howard Stern, of all people, in his new book talks about with his interview format being that he, he kind of lamented that he never got Hillary Clinton on his show because he makes the comment that his long format interview, hour, hour and a half, actually humanizes these people in a way that even people who disagreed with you know, certain people on his show will call in and say, you know, I kind of see their point, right? So yeah. I think that's a valid point. But my question revolves around the whole issue of curation, which I completely agree with. It's really critical. But the problem I have is that I think there's a step prior to curation, which is, you know, I read New York Review of Books, NPR, and I'm proud of myself for only following sources that I trust. I've spoken with people who are avid Fox viewers, InfoWars viewers, and they firmly believe they've picked a curation channel that they can trust. So I guess my really question is, is how do we step back from that? And even maybe even before we talk about social media kind of like creating these you know, clusters of people, is there a sort of a worldview problem and how do we address that? How do we sort of break through this worldview that prevents me from seeing even the arguments on the other side without resorting to an ad hominem attack? Because my answer right now is they're just idiots, right? That's not a productive way to have a discourse. That's but what unfortunately, they say that's you. what we have, right? Yeah. We have, you're an idiot, and I'm a liberal you know, nutcase from Berkeley. So um, how do we get beyond that and create dialogue around our differing worldviews that breaks through sort of this wall that we've formed around our worldviews? How do we do that? <laughs> <laughs> I kept looking over at that. I know, like, but Ellen, it's like I'm going to throw it right back to you. I'm sure Ellen can figure this out. I, well, I will have an answer. I don't know if it's going to be very helpful. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. I'm so glad you bring that up. Yeah. I, that is a huge thing. It is. The, 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 the fairness doctrine uh, required broadcasters present, to present opposing points of view. 
you had to. And under the Reagan deregulation, they eradicated the fairness doctrine. Um, yeah, you know, part, the argument was, look, there are so many stories. It's one thing when there were three broadcasters and there was one newspaper in town or whatever, but now there's so many sources of information, surely you don't need to, you know, balance everything within everything. But they did not anticipate the rise of right-wing radio, right, which never has to present an opposing point of view or, you know, the whatever the left-wing analog of that might be. Um, and, and I think it would be a pretty good idea, thank you for raising that, uh, to reintroduce the fairness doctrine. It would be hugely controversial. It won't happen in my lifetime, but it's, it's, it'd, be, it'd be worthwhile to, because they, they never anticipated the damage to society that's caused by the siloed. And, it, and, and liberals are as guilty of it as, as, as conservatives because nobody's got a corner on the truth. You know, people hated the idea that Trump was gonna take on China aggressively about some of their very unfair and scary practices. I mean, you try to do business in China, as, as some of my companies do, and you know, it's, you just can't, you know, and, 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 and that's wrong. And, and so, you know, it turns out maybe that turns out to be a good idea. So absolutism on, on, on any front is dangerous and anything, I, I think the fairness doctrine is a, is but, you a big know, but since, since we're so entrepreneurial, maybe, maybe we could do it ourselves without worrying about the, the government coming in. Because the truth is, you know, the minute you hear a fairness doctrine, of course, there's not the binary is false. There's more than there's not there's 10 points of view. There's not two points of view. But the practice of routinely including other points of view isn't false. Yeah. So if there was a way to find sources, media, media companies who would be you know, willing to to state maybe not I don't, maybe certification isn't the right thing or a blue check mark isn't the right thing, but just be part of a community that would actually routinely do the hard work because it is hard work. And like, most people don't want to do it. I mean, no, none I of us want to do it. I curate a newsletter yeah. which is opposing points of view, and it's it's hard work, and I do a lot of fact checking of other people's stuff, and sometimes I I amplify things that I personally am uncomfortable with. Or I don't feel like I fully understand for the sole purpose of making sure that I am doing a good faith effort as a curator. So it's, but, it's but risky. Then, but then you have Fox News, who has just totally given up pretending that they are a news station, and they are almost propaganda now. I mean, and- They're completely propaganda. Yeah. And I, it's hard to think as, I always used to make my bosses go on Fox News. Harry Reid was the first Democrat to go on with, with back in the day, because I'm like, you have to talk to people that are not like you. You're such a good person. I tried, <laughs> I tried. But now I completely applaud people that aren't going on. And I was always like, more access, take on hard questions, because it's not, it is literally, they don't even care about the truth. I mean, it is, like, when they won't admit that the Nancy Pelosi video is doctored. Oh my God. That is, that's, I do you're feel, not a news organization. I feel like Chris Wallace is like blinking, like a sign for help. It's yeah. like, come get me, come get Stock me. I agree, Stockholm you know? Syndrome. I also, I'll go on your podcast. <laughs> I also think that in the meantime, before we can do something like pass the fairness, repass the Fairness Act, I think, some of it is actually going back to trying to get closer to face-to-face -face conversations and really talking to each other. I mean, the person who you want to call an idiot, and I'm sure they want to call you an idiot, as challenging as it is, if you were to sit down with someone and hear their story, I, to me it's all about the way that we create empathy between people is storytelling as human beings. And so how can you be open to and be in a situation where you're listening to someone's story that's significantly different from your own. And so I think that it is through different kinds of platforms and different ways that you can try to be closer to someone rather than further and further apart as we resort to things like social media all the time. It goes back to the emphasis on town halls. How can we take that ourselves and really understand? The other thing that I would say for the um, trying to figure out what sources are true I feel like there's an educational component. Like we don't have any part, or I didn't have any part in my elementary, middle, or high school where I really was evaluating news sources and trying to understand what facts were, even if, you know, what I should be seeing in different sources and how to judge those things. So how do we introduce that into curricula? Because, I mean, it's vitally important, I think. Yeah, to me, this, this is education. You know, we've, we've reached the end of our hour but I'll, I'll just say, listening to the um, you know, diversity of views, the sheer smarts of this panel makes me feel a little bit regretful. I don't have a Brown degree. But more important, <laughs> <laughs> very, very deeply grateful to be part of this community, to be teaching here at Brown, to be a Brown parent, 
So I want to thank you all, Jenny Bacchus, John Klein, Ellen McGurd, Jenny Kaplan. Thank you all for your questions. And 